I wanted to talk about the SEC East. So Georgia's representing the SEC East in the national championship game. They have been the dominant program in the East for a few years now, even though they didn't win the East last year. They've still been the top program in the East for a while. Let me clearly restate my opinion on the national championship game next Monday night. I'm a believer it's a must win for Georgia. I kind of went further in depth on this the other night, but I believe it's the best team that Kirby's had. It's been the most advantageous path, so much so that they could afford to lose in Atlanta and still make it to the playoff. I certainly think, this goes hand in hand, it's been the most vulnerable Alabama has been. They're in the title game, but that's a testament to Alabama. This Alabama team doesn't measure up to some of the past great Saban teams. And I'm saying all that to say, if not now, when for Georgia? You're going to hear a lot of people say that. It's going to be a, a very old and kind of uh, a parroted refrain as the week goes on. So I'll probably lean on that less and less as the game approaches. But those were three reasons. There's one more reason that I haven't talked about on the show yet. I know it's perception right now that the SEC East is just Georgia's birthright and their season really starts when they get to Atlanta or when they get in the playoff. Don't assume that's always the way it's going to be. The SEC East is shifting pretty quickly. Same thing I've told you about Clemson for a while. I'm going to tell you about the SEC East. Clemson's found out in the ACC. Those programs, the Max Invest programs, they do not just sit still and let you beat on them forever. It may seem like that's happening, but South Carolina, Florida, Tennessee, Kentucky, they're not just going to sit still forever. In fact, they already have made moves. And I would argue whether it's in Gainesville or whether it's in Knoxville or whether it's in Columbia, Kentucky's already good. I would argue that there have been net upgrades found in all three of those towns over the past year, specifically with new hires. Well, they've all been new hires. They're all a year or less old new hires. But it's a different world when everyone has their crosshairs on you. That's the world that Alabama's lived in, Ohio State lives in it, Georgia lives in it. But I just want to remind you, as we go into this game next Monday night, I think it is a crossroads situation for Georgia. I want you to think about this for a second. At Florida, you had Dan Mullen there. Georgia fans are being honest when they tell you they didn't want Dan Mullen fired, even though they lost to him last year. They didn't want him fired. They were very comfortable with Mullen there. Now, most of them would also be honest with you if they said when they heard Billy Napier was the hire, they weren't really concerned, and a lot of them may still not be concerned. Billy Napier and the moves he's making at Florida, they are the talk of the SEC behind the scenes. Everyone's talking about it. He has surprised a lot of people with the staff that he's started to put together. Uh, a lot of people just had their doubts. And a lot of those doubters, I mean, I've spoken to some who were doubters that have been silenced. There have been people who have changed their tune about Billy Napier just in the last month based on hires alone. They haven't seen the guy coach a game in the swamp yet. They've already had some of their fears eased by watching the staff he's put together because that was their main source of doubt about what he could walk in there and do. At South Carolina, this is the program I think that overcame this year relative to expectation more so than any, and there's a specific thing happening in Carolina. So the over-under was well short of a bowl appearance there uh, in win totals, and not only do they go to a bowl, they win it. They win seven games, beat Florida, beat Auburn, beat North Carolina in the bowl game. So we talked in the summer when I was laying out what the goal should be there. We just talked about putting a nice promising product on the field. That was really code for there's no way they're making a bowl game. Well, uh, they overachieved relative to everyone, including my expectation. They got that vision that you need. We talk about it all the time with new staffs. They will have no trouble now. Shane Beamer and his staff will have no trouble selling South Carolina because they've already given kids a product they can buy into and believe in. But here's the thing specifically happening there. They understand they're not going to go, they're in all likelihood, let me put it that way, they're not just going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Alabama. They may not even be in a position right now to go toe-to-toe -to -toe on the recruiting trail with Georgia. But I'll tell you what they can do. They can leverage the portal really hard. They could be the Michigan State of the SEC, and they already showed the propensity and capability to do it with Austin Stogner and Spencer Rattler. And I, as I told someone earlier today, we've gotten used to the hierarchy and the way things set up in traditional recruiting. The folks who dominate in recruiting don't always have to look the same as the folks who dominate the transfer portal. 
That's the formula at Carolina. You never want to build the Christmas tree out of ornaments. You never want to make the transfer portal your core strategy. But at Carolina, they need to own their state. Uh, they need to be supreme developers of talent and evaluators of talent. But then they need to leverage that portal as hard as any program in the SEC does. Because they can be a contender if they do that the right way. They've already got full culture cohesion there. So important. They're like the East version of Arkansas. But they need that right balance. And hey, early returns are very good there. And then at Tennessee, I thought what Josh Heupel did in year one at Tennessee was pretty staggering offensively. Uh, remember in the spring, I, like people don't remember this now, the roster turnover they had was beyond insane. Uh, people were ready to look at Tennessee as nothing more than a limp body midway through the season. They finished strong. They won the bowl game. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. I heard Paul Feinbaum talk about this the other day. I agree with him. I would not hesitate to define that game as a win for the Tennessee program. I absolutely believe in that because they won the game. It wasn't like a bad call happened with six minutes to go. Uh, they, they actually, I think they won the game. So uh, be that as it may. You know, you can't go that far because Purdue still would have had a possession. I remember now thinking that. Anyway, they did get screwed in the bowl game. But moving forward, what they showed the ability to do offensively just with the parts that were already there in year one, makes me very excited for what they can do in the coming years. And notice that all three of these programs, whether it's Napier at Florida, whether it's Shane Beamer and that entire culture there at South Carolina, or, or especially whether it's guys like Josh Heupel, man, especially Florida and Tennessee, those are established high-level football mind guys. Those are not guys you look forward to facing. When Pruitt was at Tennessee, think what you want about Pruitt. Georgia was never worried about facing him. Georgia folks never worried about facing Mullen either. They knew he wouldn't have the uh, horses to run with him. I think there's some good things going on in the East right now. I don't always think this competitive balance is just going to be out of whack the way we've come accustomed to seeing it. Now, I will say this. I'm not going crazy here. Yes, Georgia, for the foreseeable future, will still be the favorite in that division, as they should be. Uh, yes, they will go into your normal Saturday as a favorite. It's not any one team that's going to all of a sudden take them down and slay the dragon. It's cumulative. It's a cumulative effect. It's just understanding that instead of having three touchdowns worth of wiggle room on a given Saturday, maybe it's 11 and a half points worth of wiggle room. It means that you can't afford to bring your B minus game into some of these contests anymore. And so it's just... I think for so many reasons, but this among them, the difference in the future of this program, the, the Georgia program, the difference in the future of the Georgia program based on the result this coming Monday night could not be any more stark. It's a crossroads moment. It is the 2012 SEC championship game for Mark Rick. That's the equivalent for Kirby Smart. I know you assume they'll be there half a dozen more times. No matter, like I said the other night, no matter to what level you invest and recruit, this sport gives you a finite amount of opportunities. Nick Saban's the exception. There are no more Nick Sabans. Outside of that, you get a finite amount of reaches for the belt. And you reach once, you almost got it in 2017. Now you got another shot. You reach again, you miss it again. Someone's going to climb the ladder, give you the old shot to the pill as you fall down, and you never get back up the ladder. That's the way ladder matches always work. You know it, and I know it. That's the way ladder matches always work. Grab the belt. Take my advice. Grab the belt.